how deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that He should give His only Son to make a wretch His treasure. How great the pain of searing loss, the Father turns his face away as wounds which are the chosen one bring many sons to glory Psalms chapter 36 it says how excellent is thy loving kindness O God therefore the children of men put their trust under the shadow of thy wings behold the man upon sin upon his shoulders ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers it was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished his dying John chapter 4 speaks about this love. Here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. We just sing this last verse with us, church. I will not boast. I will not boast in anything. No gifts, no power, no wisdom. But I will boast in Jesus. Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart. His roots have been my should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart, his wounds have been my ransom. One time, church, why should? Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart, his wounds have paid my morning church family our bible reading will be taken from jeremiah 23 1 through 6 and jeremiah 33 14 to 16 woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pastors said the lord therefore thus said the lord god of israel against the pastors that feed my people. Ye have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doing, saith the Lord. And I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries, whether I have driven them, and will bring them again to their fall, and they shall be fruitful and increase. And I will set up shepherds over them, which shall feed them, and they shall fear no more. 
nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. Behold, the day come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and the king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his day, Judah shall be safe, and Israel shall dwell safely, and this is his name, whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. Behold, the day come, said the Lord, that I will perform that good thing which I have promised unto the house of Israel and to the house of Judah. In those days and at that time will I cause the branch of righteousness to grow up unto David, and he shall execute judgment and righteousness in the land. In those days shall Judah be saved, and Jerusalem shall dwell safely. And this is the name wherewith she shall be called, the Lord our righteousness. Church family, this is God's word to us. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God. There shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. His rest shall be glorious. In mercy shall the throne be established. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. This is his name whereby he shall be called, the Lord our righteousness. Well, I got sent to the principal's office one time in my life. Now, all the kids are in the room, and I just wanted them to know that. Where are the kids? Wave at me, kids. Stand up if you're a kid. Not if you act like one, just if you are one, okay? Wave at me. Okay, now sometimes your parents misbehave in church, so I really need you to make sure they're good today, okay? All right? Okay, you guys can be seated. Uh, third grade, Roswell Elementary School, Roswell, Georgia, Miss Kennedy's class. My friend Bryant and I were sitting on either side of a girl in between, and her name was Mary Jane. And I don't know which was the first one to do it, it, but one of us poked her and agitated her, and she turned and said, stop, and then the one on the other side joined in and said, poked and agitated, and then she'd turn the other way and say, stop, and then the other one of us would do it, and and, then no matter which way she turned, the other one was irritating her, and this persisted for several minutes until my teacher, Miss Kennedy, had enough. And she said, okay, Carrie, Mary Jane, Bryant, all of you, go to the principal's office. Now that had never happened to me before. I didn't know what would happen at the principal's office. All I knew is that everybody I knew that ever went there never came back alive. (laughs) It was the end of life on planet Earth as far as I knew. I just remember walking out of that room with my friend Bryant. Poor Mary Jane, she had done nothing wrong, you know. She just had the unfortunate misery of being in the wrong place at the wrong time between two troublemaking little boys. So a few minutes later, we find ourselves sitting in the principal's office. His name was Mr. Griffin. Um, Now, I'm 52. This story is still with me, okay? This is how traumatic of an event this was in my life. I was quite sure I was going to die. I was quite sure I was going to be incarcerated, never to be able to see my family again. I didn't really know what was going to happen, but it was traumatic, okay? Well, fast forward, suffice to say, I survived. You know, I did get in trouble with Mr. Griffin and with my parents, and uh, life proceeded on forward, and I didn't ever really want to go to the principal's office again. But fast forward the clock about eight years, 
and seven maybe. Now I'm 15. Now we live in another city. We moved north to Alpharetta. We've lived there for a number of years. I haven't seen Mr. Griffin since I was in fourth grade because from fourth grade on, I was in a different school. My dad had a little Toyota truck with a camper, a back camper on it. He used it for some of his job. He, was, he traveled a little bit with his job. And we were moving, we were relocating out of state, liquidating stuff, and he was selling his Toyota camper. And he said to me, there's, a, there's an older couple, a retired couple that's coming to look at the camper, to buy the camper. Well, a few minutes later, a car pulled up the driveway. It was a long driveway. The house was set back off the road considerable ways in the woods. The senior couple came up the driveway, and who, who got out of the car? Mr. Griffin. And I'm telling you, seven years later, my heart seized. I mean, palpitations, cold sweats, my palms get sweaty, I start to hyperventilate. I'm sure he remembers that I got sent to his office. My guilt, my shame has traveled with me all this time, and here it is. Here's the silly thing about this, okay? I did go outside, I did talk to Mr. Griffin. He did not remember me. I was sure he would. I was sure I was the worst kid he ever talked to, and that he was sure to that day that I was a living criminal headed for lifetime incarceration, you know. There was, that I was a hopeless project. No, Mr. Griffin didn't have any frame of reference uh, at this stage of his life, and in relation to me, this 15-year-old kid, he had long forgotten about this, but I hadn't. And it was with me, and when I saw Mr. Griffin, it all came back. Now let me ask you a question. Do you ever have that experience with, other, with someone else in your life? Maybe someone that did, did you wrong, somebody that hurt you, somebody that, and, and just you bump into them at Costco or Sam's Club, you see them on the, and you go the other way? Because it brings it back, it either brings back the pain, the regret, or the guilt, or the shame. And basically, you, that, 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 uh, that thing between you and that person, that event, or that state of things, or maybe your failure, or theirs, has come basically to define the context of that relationship. And so, that's how you relate to that person, that's how they relate to you. And even though maybe there's forgiveness, even though maybe it's a long time ago, we carry these things with us. And here's what I, where I wanna go today. A lot of us, even those of us who claim to believe in Jesus and know him as Savior, we carry with us something of guilt, shame, failure, regret, something of our, where we know we have fallen short. We carry that in context to our relationship with God. And we're sure, now here's the deal. I know what the Bible says. I know if I trust Jesus as my Savior, I'm forgiven. I know that here, but do I appropriate it here? Do I relate to God still on the basis of my failures, trying to prove to him that I'm not so bad? Do I relate to God on the basis of his high expectations, working harder and harder, trying to live up to them, whether I'm saved by faith and just working hard out of that, or trying to work to be saved. There's kind of two, two contexts to what we call legalism. One is working to obtain salvation. The other is working almost to pay it off or to keep it or to retain it in some way. It's easy for us to say, I know, I know, I know that God has forgotten my sin, but, but it really is hard for us to believe it when, when we remember it so easily. We remember it so, you know, it just comes back to our memory and we struggle in it day after day after day in this thing we, called life, we call life. Well, what I wanna share with you today is a phrase, just really one phrase that we're gonna unfold in three, through three different prisms that I pray will set you free from you framing your relationship with God through the lens of your performance. Even as a Christian, uh, moving the gospel from your head to your heart where you can live in, 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 in love with Jesus, truly celebrating him and truly growing up in who he says you are, not who you think you are, or who are you sure he probably still believes you are. No, he drives right to the core of our hearts and our souls with this phrase, and I want you to look at it with me. It, 
It's at the end of the passage that Dale read a moment ago, Jeremiah 23, 6. Okay, now the context of Jeremiah is bigger than I have time to explore today. Uh, Israel's coming to the end of their national history, at least for a season. God's going to put them in quarantine. He's gonna shut down the nation. He's going to take many of them hostage into captivity into Babylon. Jeremiah has spent 40 years preparing the people for this event and teaching them either to come back to God, that God wants them back. Many of them have given up on God and have become idolatrous and pagan in their practices. Others of them are a remnant holding on to hope and faith and promise, but they're still gonna be, uh, they're gonna have a hard time. It's dark times, it's a difficult time. And, and Jeremiah is getting them ready and showing them that God is doing something very, very big, okay? And at this point in Jeremiah's prophecy, he says, I, he, he begins to indict the pastors. And we looked at Ezekiel 34 on Friday night as well. These two passages talk about failed pastors. And God indicts, in the context of the Old Testament, he's talking about the priests, the shepherds that were, that were supposed to be teaching God's ways to God's people, especially God's ways of grace, God's ways of, of, uh, of salvation, through an Old Testament gospel lens, okay, which I don't have time to unfold all that, but they, they got off mission, and God says, I'm indicting the pastors for not teaching truth and for not giving my people what they need, and then he says, I'm gonna be their shepherd. I'm gonna come myself, and I'm going to give them the shepherding that they truly deserve, and that's why this passage points us to Christmas and to Jesus as our shepherd, our ultimate shepherd, and to the big promises of Christmas. And I want you to look at verse six. In his days, this coming king, this coming savior, in his days, Judah shall be saved and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name whereby he shall be called. And look at the rest of that verse and I want you to say it out loud with me. Ready, go. The Lord our righteousness. Now change the word our to my. All right, make it personal and say it again. Ready? The Lord, my righteousness. So I got three things I want you to know about this phrase, the Lord, our righteousness, which is actually a formal name. It's God giving him a name. It's, it's him naming himself. But he's saying, this is who I want you to know me as, the Lord, your righteousness. What does that mean? Okay, well, first of all, it means that Jesus can declare me righteous. It means that Jesus, the Savior, the Christmas, the promise of Christmas that was prophesied for hundreds of years is that there would be a king that would be born as God in the lineage of David, and he would be a perfect king and a perfect life, and he would grow up and he would suffer. And in that suffering, he would be accomplishing a massive work, and that work would be he would be atoning for my sins and flaws and imperfections so that he could make available to me his perfection, his righteousness. When you think of the word righteousness, think rightness, his perfection, his purity in every way. And so when God prophesied in Jeremiah, I'm gonna send you a shepherd and you will call him the Lord, our righteousness. Let me give you four words that describe this word in terms of this phrase of a declaration. I want you to write these words down if you're taking notes. This is a judicial declaration, first of all, judicial. It is secondly, positional. It is thirdly, familial, and fourthly, relational. So those are the four words I want you to frame very quickly. I'm gonna pass by them quickly. Judicial and positional. It's almost like in a courtroom with God as the judge and me as the defender, me as the one on trial, okay, God, the judge, says, I'm going to make a way through the Savior of Christmas, through Jesus born in the manger, I'm gonna make a way to declare you righteous, sinless, guilt-free, shame-free, to absolve all of your failure with me. We call this forgiveness, we call this justification, God says, I'm gonna declare you. So in, in one way, it's, it's legal. It's kind of this, um, this, judi this judicial exoneration that's formal. But in another way, it's personal. It's relational. It's familial. It is to say, you, you can belong to me. You can have my name. You can have my identity. You can have all that pertains to me through a family 
birth, through a family relationship. Uh, this Jesus, our righteousness, reconciles me to God in a familial relationship. I was thinking this past week of when really all three of my kids were born, but especially Haley for some reason. Haley was our third born, she's 21 now. She, Dana was seven months bed rest with Haley. Uh, then the last month she was in the hospital. Haley was born I think seven weeks, maybe eight weeks early, I can't remember. They had to give a shot of, of steroids to mature her lungs. They weren't sure she would cry when she was born. They did everything they could do to keep her in the womb. And uh, finally it was like, okay, she's, she's coming. We're gonna go into emergency C-section. I was an hour and a half, the hospital was an hour and a half from home. So Dana called me, get down here quick. I, I made my way to the hospital in Southern California and made my way into the OR and there with Dana sitting in her head while they're uh, taking care of getting Haley out of the womb. And I'll never forget, sure enough, Haley cried. They brought her up by Dana's head. Dana cried, I cried. We, we took a quick glimpse of Haley who'd been trying to be born for seven or eight months and they whisked her off to the NICU and then they whisked off Dana to recovery and suddenly I'm there alone in Woodland Hills, California uh, and I got hungry so I went to lunch and I sat there alone, I just felt like a king. And I don't know what it was about having a daughter that made me feel so different, but I said, I have a daughter. And the, the waitress came up and she said, what do you want? I said, I want the best meal you have. Why? I said, because I have a daughter. I have a daughter. And I remember several hours later, our boys got there with their grandparents. We went to the NICU, they let us come in. And I remember grabbing Larry, Larry's hand, he was five. For as long as he could pray, I mean, maybe he was two and a half when he started being able to pray. He would pray dear, every night, dear Jesus, please give me a baby sister. By the time Haley was three, he started praying, Lord, please take away my baby sister. <laughs> I, every, every time Larry got frustrated with Haley, I said, you prayed for her. Like, well, she's here because of you. But I grabbed Larry's hand, I walked him over to the little, to the little incubator there, and Haley was so small. Her whole body could fit between the, the bend of my elbow and the bend of my wrist right there. And I picked her up and they had her on feeding tube and all these things and, and I, I brought Larry over and I introduced Larry, not only to his sister, but to his answer to prayer. I wanted him to see God answered his prayer and that our God is a loving father and faithful. But the reason I, I, I paint that picture before you is that Haley was born into life through no, she, she did not earn uh, any status in our family. She did not achieve, she did not buy it. There was nothing she did. Uh, she didn't bring anything to the table, so to speak, okay? She was born into com complete familial love and acceptance and protection and provision and all the things uh, that relate to my name, my identity as her dad, okay, uh, pertain to her by birth. When, when we read scripture, when God says, I'm gonna be your righteousness, it is the savior of the universe saying, I want to birth you into my family through no, through no deserving and no achievement of your own. I wanna, I wanna adopt you, I wanna fold you into all the things that pertain to me. By declaration, you're going to belong to me and my love is going to be yours, it's going to be set on you and I'm, I'm gonna declare you, even though you struggle, even though you know your struggles better than anybody else, and, and God says, I know your struggles better than anybody else, I still declare you righteous. In other words, I'm not gonna relate to you on the basis of your flaws or your own moral achievements. I'm gonna relate to you on the basis of Jesus. Which brings me to the second aspect of this declaration. The second aspect is this, Jesus, he doesn't just declare me righteous. We sing about that, by the way, hail the son of righteousness, okay? Born to raise us from the earth, born to give us second birth, declaration of life. God set his name on me, I become his. But secondly, Jesus then develops me in this righteousness. Now this is where it gets really important. Okay, it's all really important, but in terms of the practical side of this, in the first position, the declaration is judicial and positional and familial and relational, but this principle, I want you to write these words down, it's practical, it is experiential, it is transformational, okay? Once you know Jesus as Savior, you begin a journey. 
you begin a relationship with him. You're brought to him on the basis of his righteousness and you're given the ability by him, by his presence, by his spirit, to then grow up in his righteousness. I have grappled all week with how to illustrate this and how to, how to bring this into a practical sense with you, but first let me, look at, let me look at scriptures with you and then I'll give you a couple of, of ideas. Isaiah says it this way, Surely shall one say in the Lord, have I righteousness and strength, okay? I'm declared righteous, in God's eyes I am righteous, but he's gonna give me the strength to live out of that righteousness. Ezekiel says it this way, God says it this way in Ezekiel. Then I will sprinkle clean water upon you and ye shall be clean. From all of your filthiness, from all of your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you. Now think, look at who the operator is. Look at your role and God's role in this passage, okay? The person being referred to in this passage is growing and becoming better. Their heart is made soft, their spirit is made new, they're brought back to life. Uh, God says, I'll put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. So this person that God is talking to is now going to be walking in God's ways and learning his truth and his principles and obeying him and keeping his judgments, he says in verse 27. But look at the operative person. God is the one doing the work. God is the one doing the transformation, and the receiver, you and me, okay, see, this, these principles carry straight forward from ancient Israel right through Jesus and the Gospels into the New Testament and into your life and mine. Why? Because the New Testament explains that when we place faith in Christ, we're grafted in to the promises of God. The Gospel brings us into the family. And so, yeah, Ezekiel is talking to ancient Israelites in Babylon in captivity, giving them hope, but the, the, the promise plays out in all the New Testament. God says, I'm gonna declare you righteous. You're gonna be mine, you're gonna have my name and all the rights pertaining to that, but then I'm gonna grow you, I'm gonna change you. I'm gonna make you different. I, I grew up, and I'm thankful for all of my heritage. Don't misunderstand what I'm about to say. But I grew up, and I, I had exposure to several environments in my Christian journey, where the lion's share of the preaching and Bible teaching was work harder, God's upset with you, he's ticked off at you, you can never do enough, you're not good enough, you're a total loser. And it was like, it was like screaming angry preaching at rebels, frankly, and the rebels generally weren't even sitting in the room. It was like a pastor carrying on a rhetorical argument with people that weren't even there. Meanwhile, the sheep that were there were not being fed gospel realities like I'm feeding you today. They were hearing this works-based, moralistic, hard work, and it's, like, it's kind of like this. It, it, hard legalism is you work to be saved, but there's kind of a soft legalism, it's all bad, but there's kind of this legalistic thinking, and that is, okay, you don't work to be saved, but, but after you're saved, you better get to work. Like now that you're saved, you owe God a lot of stuff and you gotta pay down your debt and, and God expects you to live up to his demands. That's equally crushing, okay? Because that's not really the message of the Bible. But, but be careful lest your mind go slingshot all the way, pendulum swing all the way to the other side of things that says, well, if I'm declared righteous and then my behavior doesn't matter, then I'll just be and do whatever I wanna do. That's wrong too. No, because the grace that saves you comes to live in you in the form of God's spirit. And that spirit is gonna motivate you and change you and transform you. And, it, and the transformation is not gonna be a product of your hard work. It is gonna be a product of you yielding control to the presence and the power of God within you. And God is gonna take a hard-hearted you and make it a soft-hearted you and a stubborn you and make, make it a, a willingly obedient you and all the things. Here's the thing about the legalistic kind of preaching. Legalistic kind of preaching basically says you, God's always relating to you on the basis of how he measures your performance for him. And the, the two extremes of that is you're, you, you either Fa try and try and try and fail and then eventually give up in despair 
and then Christianity was something you tried and you walked away from. Or you downsize God's righteousness into a box that you can actually do, like into rules you can actually keep, like you customize it for you, and, and then you do it really good, and then you puff up in pride and self-righteousness, and you think you're awesome. You think you're amazing, and you think you're better than everybody else. Both extremes are toxic. Both extremes are absolutely neutralizing to the work of God in your life because God's not measuring you based on you. He's not measuring you, okay? Because Jesus fulfilled the measurements. There's nothing to measure, but he is growing you. And he doesn't, for your own good, doesn't want you to continue. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. In other words, does God's grace motivate us just to live in sin? No. It motivates us to trust the same Jesus who saves us to lead us in his ways and obey his laws and follow his instructions and let his spirit reshape us and change us. The other part of legalism is you're, you're really shortcutting the work of God and replacing it with your work which means you're not experiencing God's work the way it is organically or the way he wants to organically grow it in your life. Paul describes it this way. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, not based, not based on your exceptional abilities, not based on your amazing performance, no, based on the mercies of God, that you present your bodies, your flesh, your existence, your life, a living sacrifice. Just give yourself to, to the hands of your shepherd, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Just makes sense, he says. I wish I could unpack all these phrases. And be not conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You have a savior, Jesus, through Christmas, through the Christmas story, who not only declares you righteous in God's sight so that you're off the measurement grid of God's judicial authority. No, he then comes into your life and says, let me change you. Experience me at work in you. Yield to me your, yourself. Give me yourself so that I can renew your mind, that you may prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. There's a song that I sing a lot at Christmas. I play it a lot in the background of my life. It's the first song, it's one of my favorite Christmas albums. I've got about five of them. It's Fernando Ortega's Christmas album. So you wanna look it up, look it up later. But the first song is Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. Anybody ever heard this song? Great song. Listen to the words. Come Thou Long Expected Jesus, born to set thy people free. From our fears and sins, release us. Let us find our rest in thee. Israel's strength and consolation, hope of all the earth thou art. Dear desire of every nation, joy of every longing heart. But listen to the second verse. Born thy people to deliver, born a child and yet a king, born to reign in us forever, now thy gracious kingdom bring. By thine own eternal spirit, rule in our hearts alone. Now let me just pause. None of us likes to give up control of our lives, and at the same time, none of us really has control. The threat of Jesus' lordship, losing autonomy, what does that even mean? Oh no. But can I tell you, if he was good enough to come for you and lavish enough to die for you, isn't he trustworthy enough to lead you and guide you and change you and shape you? And couldn't you pray with me, by thine own eternal spirit, rule in my heart, Lord. By thine, all, look, listen to this, by thine all sufficient merit, God, you your, it's your merit. Jesus, you're the one that has the merit. But raise me, grow me, change me by your grace. So Jesus first declares me righteous. Secondly, he develops me in righteousness. That's practical. It's experiential. It's transformational.
I'm not breathlessly panting after righteousness to try to achieve, to measure up to God's demands. But I am trusting him to grow me. I am walking with him as he's shaping and forming and changing and transforming for the rest of my life. Paul said, being, Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath, say it with me if you know it, he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. You never have a reason to quit on God. You never have a reason to give up in despair. You never have a reason to hide in the house because Mr. Griffin's in the driveway and you're sure he's gonna remember you. You never have a reason to do anything but run to God. Why? Because he knows you, he loves you, he is shaping you and changing you, and he is your righteousness. You are not your own righteousness. If you are your own righteousness, then be terrified. Run for your life. But if Jesus is your righteousness, then rest in it and receive the work that surgeon Jesus wants to do in your heart and let him shape you and let him grow you and let him change you over the course of your life because as long as you're alive, he will be continuing that good work and you can have confidence in it. Number three, we're done. You guys still with me? We're almost there. I'm trying to be short today because this is the day after Christmas and you guys want me to be. Number three, Jesus will deliver me in righteousness. Now these, the descriptors here, this is eventual. So this is something we look forward to. It's hopeful. It's eternal. It's irreversible. Once this happens, it's over. It's final. And this is where we turn to Jeremiah 33, and this was the second passage that Dale read. Behold, the days come they will come. We've seen that a lot in this series. The days are going to come. And if you're a Christian holding on to the hope and the promise of Jesus, you're among good company <laughs> because there are generations of believers going back 24, 2700 years to Jeremiah and Isaiah who equally held in dark days to the days are coming. The days are coming, promises. So behold, the days come that, say, uh, that, that the Lord, uh, saith the Lord, that I will perform that good thing which I have promised unto the house of Israel, to the house of Judah. In those days and at that time will I cause, and we've studied this, the branch of righteousness to grow up unto David, and he shall execute judgment and righteousness in the land in those days shall Judah be saved. Jerusalem shall dwell safely. And catch this. This is an important thing. This is the name wherewith. What's the pronoun there? She. What's that talking about? If you go back to the first passage, it says this is the name whereby he shall be called. The Lord our righteousness. But a few chapters later, the same God says this is the name whereby she shall be called. Now we could say in the nearest fulfillment of this, he's talking about Jerusalem and Judah and the, the nation of Israel. But again, you come forward into Romans and you find out that God's broken down the partition between Jews and Gentiles and that anybody can have faith in this promise. Anybody can be born into this promise. And so let me tell you who she is. She is you if you trust Jesus. What Jesus is saying is, I'm gonna be your righteousness and I'm gonna give you my name. And you'll be delivered once and for all. Once and for all. Daniel 9 calls this God bringing in everlasting righteousness. So run the race because you've already won. Stay in the battle and fight the war because the war is already over in terms of Jesus has already promised you victory. I've been taking classes. Some of you are in school. You'll identify with this. You get into these classes and um, the, the teachers, you got the lectures, you got the reading, you got the writing and the research and the footnoting and all the, and all the work. And in the classes I've been taking, there's basically a thousand points, you know, and you're working all the way through to, to earn up to a thousand points. And here's what I found out. When you're focused on getting the points, you tend not to focus on learning the material. 
I mean like really learning it, like really appropriating it. You tend to memorize it to pass, and then it's just kind of out. And I thought, man, how cool would it be? Because I'm taking these classes because I wanna learn. I want the material. And how cool would it be if there were no grading scale? I don't mean so I could slide by. I mean so I could focus on the material. So I could focus on consuming and growing and becoming from this material, letting it change me and letting it really get into my heart and mind. And you know, so, it comes down to Sunday afternoon and my paper's due Sunday night at midnight. You know, let's say I'm halfway done and I still gotta find 20 footnotes. You tell me, this is hy hypothetical of course. You tell me, am I finding footnotes because I'm really learning or am I finding footnotes because I'm, st I'm still 10 short? You understand what I'm saying? Okay, when you're on a performance metric with God you're, all, you're focused on your righteousness and your performance. And you're not experiencing organic transformation. You're not experiencing ultimate growth, okay? When I say that Jesus will deliver me in righteousness, I'm talking about that eternal, that infinite, that, 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 that moment where God says, you're, you're free from all sin and the presence and the influence and the, the temptation. All of your struggles are gonna go away. But here's the, practica the practicality of that, okay? If this were structured in a way that you had to learn God's laws to pass God's tests, you would, your heart wouldn't really be changing. You would just be memorizing facts and jumping through hoops and doing, you'd just be dancing to God's tune because he says you have to so you can get what God has to give you. You would simply be trying to leverage a performance to obtain control of God's resources. <laughs> You'd just be trying to get credit. Okay, but Jesus has set you and me free from that. He said, no, this isn't about performance. This isn't about you having to achieve and dance through hoops, and jump through hoops to get credit. No, I'm gonna give you the credit. I'm gonna give you my righteousness. I'm gonna give you so much more than that. I'm gonna give you myself, and I'm gonna live in your heart, and I'm gonna grow up in you and with you, and, and, and I'm gonna grow my righteousness up in you, and I'm gonna be your friend, and I'm gonna walk with you, and I'm gonna mentor you, and coach you, and guide you, and teach you, and I'm gonna be a shepherd to you, and then I'm gonna set you free from all of this, and I'm gonna make you absolutely perfect, and when it's all said and done, you're gonna be free from all struggles, free from all fear, free from all sin, free from all temptation, free from all regret, all of it, so I'm giving you the credit, the victory, before you even start the class. Why? So don't focus on the class. Focus on the experience of God transforming you. Do you get that? Does that make sense? I'm, I'm free now to stop trying to rummage through and find, you know, snowball the teacher. No, now I'm free because I'm not performing for God's affirmation. I'm not trying to live up or to con God into thinking I'm better than I really am, like some would con their teacher into thinking they're smarter than they really are, no. I'm free to say I'm accepted by God. I've, I've passed all of this test because Jesus did it for me. And now I'm free to grow up in God's grace because he accepts me on the basis of Jesus. Now friends, this is what it means to have Jesus as my righteousness. If you've never accepted Jesus as your righteousness, listen to Romans three. Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified. There's no doing that can justify you with God. No religion, nothing. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Actually, it's God's laws that show you how flawed we are, verse 21. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifest or made visible Verse 22, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believed. Verse 23 says we've all sinned and come short of God's glory, but verse 24 says we can all be justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Jesus. 
So here it is. If you've never trusted Christ, my invitation to you online in the room is to invite Jesus to be your righteousness, your hope, place your trust in him. But many of you have. So here's my challenge to you. Here's, here's the celebration for you. You never have to have a Mr. Griffin experience with God. He knows. He remembers. If that's who you think God is, you're not going to relate to him at all. You're just going to go through motions and keep him at arm's distance. But if you understand Jesus is your righteousness, then you can rest in God and you can enjoy him and you can grow up in him, and you can trust him to change you. Let's have our heads bowed and our eyes closed. God, thank you, thank you, thank you for this truth. The Lord, our righteousness. It is not my righteousness that gives me a relationship with you, it is yours. Knowing you are never measuring me, but you are always growing me, is a wonderful, wonderful, liberating reality. God, thank you for your great gift. With our heads bowed and eyes closed, if you have never trusted Jesus as your savior online in the room, I wanna invite you to do so in just a moment. If you have right now, why don't you ask him to grow you in righteousness this year? But if you haven't, if today is the day that God's spirit is knocking on the door of your heart saying, trust me, let me into your life, let me exonerate you, let me grow you, let me save you. My friend, the way you receive that is what we just read, by faith through grace, or by grace through faith. Those two words together, faith is belief, trust, core trust, Grace is God's arms reaching out to you, extending it, saying receive it, believe it if you want it. And if you're saying yes to that offer today, then Romans says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And wherever you are, I would invite you to make this decision sincerely from your heart. You could pray right where you are. Something like this, Jesus, I admit that I am sinful and separated from you and guilty and I, I need a savior. And I believe that you are the savior. You are my only hope of being declared righteous with God and growing up in that righteousness and being one day delivered to it so Jesus, right now, I'm accepting and trusting you as my personal savior. Come into my life and save me. Now maybe this is the day of your decision and maybe it's not. God and you, you, you know where your heart is and God knows where your heart is. If today is that day of decision, I wanna encourage you to tell somebody and I wanna encourage you to come by the next step tables. We've got a Bible and a book called Real Christianity we wanna give you. Just tell the folks there, I prayed with Pastor Kerry, I'd like that Bible. They'd be happy to give it to you. We congratulate you on your decision. If you're online, email me personally, pastor at ebcnewington.com. Be happy to get back to you. If this is a day where this is new information to you, then I invite you to ask questions. Do your own research. Understand, this is the offer of God to the human race. And it's the most important decision you will ever consider in your life. God, thank you so much for your grace and that Christmas is not just about some fantasy or fairy tale. It is a true story about the creator of the universe coming to us and for us to be our righteousness. Help us to move that from our heads to our hearts. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we have uh, some folks to be baptized before we go. And we want to welcome also uh, the Ovalle family. This is um, Fernando and Loredana. Where are the Ovalles? They were, I saw you right there. They got the whole family with them today. So Ana Sofia, Samuel, and Esteban. 
Raise your hands, guys. There they are. And the Elvais are wonderful people. I've enjoyed getting to know them. They drive all the way from Norwalk, and uh, I can't believe that you do that, but thank you uh, for wanting to be a part of, of our church family. Um, and uh, what a wonderful testimony they have. So we need a motion and a, and a second to receive the Ovalles at Emmanuel. I have that. So all in favor, say amen. amen. And let's welcome the Ovalle family. <laughs> so everybody in this section, when, they, when we're done, that's your target right there, okay? Welcome them to the church family, and I'm so thankful for the Ovalles. Baptism is a picture, nothing more than a picture. Baptism does not wash away sins or save any soul. It's simply a statement, a public profession that says, I am not ashamed that I've trusted Jesus and I want you to know. Uh, and it's a biblical, we follow in this because Jesus is our example and because he, everyone in scripture that trusted Jesus, their first step of obedience was to be baptized, to publicly state, I belong to Jesus and I'm not ashamed. So we're thankful for, we had a family in the first service that were baptized, and now in the second. Lance? Today we have Fred and Valerie Baker uh, who have come to be baptized, and I've had the wonderful privilege of just hearing their awesome testimony and uh, of their commitment to Christ already. And so they have uh, come to be baptized today and to join our church. We're excited. So Valerie, I'll go to you first here. Um, have you accepted Christ as your Savior? Yes, okay. I have. On that profession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection. Fred, have you accepted Christ as your Savior? Yes. On that profession of faith, I baptize you, my friend, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection. All right, let's stand together. I want you to sing and then uh, go out and celebrate the second day of Christmas. Have a great afternoon. All right, church family, let's sing Death Was Arrested again. Alone in my sorrow and death in my sin, lost without hope.
family, you are dismissed.